Hello, and welcome to the Transforming Loneliness interview series. I'm Laura Parker, the creator and host of the series. Transforming Loneliness approaches loneliness with fresh and unexpected ways of seeing and responding that cultivate connection, belonging, and love. Today, I'm very happy to be with Neil McKinley. Neil McKinley is a senior teacher within the Dharma Ocean lineage. A longtime student of Reggie Ray, Neil draws from his training in the tradition of Chogyam Trungpa to emphasize the accessibility and relevance of meditation in the modern world. Seeing the spiritual journey as an inherent part of the human journey, his teaching style is immediate and personal, always affirming the dignity and wholeness of our lives as they are. I met Neil through my participation in several somatic meditation retreats and online programs which Neil taught. It felt important to me to have Neil's voice in this summit because through the Dharma Ocean meditation practices, I have discovered courage, strength, and confidence in my basic goodness to do very deep transformative inner work. The Transforming Loneliness Project was inspired during a bodhicitta meditation in which I saw that my many years of personal and professional experience with loneliness had given me something useful to offer to others. So here we are. Neil, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So Neil, in your work and your tradition, the lineage of Dharma Ocean, how is loneliness viewed? Well, it was an interesting question to contemplate when you raised it, um, because I don't know that I've heard a great deal about loneliness explicitly in the tradition. You know, we'll talk about aloneness, you know, that um, the fundamental sense of aloneness that many of us feel as um, our unique expression of the universe meets other necessarily unique expressions of the universe and, and that sense of being immersed in the mystery of not knowing and never knowing that aloneness but you know loneliness it feels like something else altogether and um having considered this for some time since we first talked actually laura you know i think loneliness is um what the buddhists a manifestation of what the buddhists call samsara it's a particular manifestation of suffering that arises from our um, deep estrangement from immediate experience. Yeah, and so um, how does, in your tradition, how does, uh, how do they think about this deep estrangement from immediate experience? Well, I used the word uh, samsara before. Um, it's a bit of a jargon term, you know, it's a Buddhist jargon term, but it's actually helpful. It points to something very helpful. You know, samsara is the state of mind we find ourselves in when we believe our projections, when we believe our beliefs, our ideas and beliefs about life, the universe and everything when we believe our the reactions that arise from those um, ideas beliefs and opinions and we begin to relate to our lives we begin to relate to ourselves we begin to relate to others we begin to relate to you know the cosmic the cosmic whole um, through these ideas so we don't relate to life as it is but we relate to life as we think it is and that distinction is a separation and it's a separation from something fundamental for all of us, from something fundamental about who we are. And in that moment of separation, you know, you've been using the word loneliness. I think there is a sense of loneliness in there. And then as that separation grows and grows and grows, um, that sense of estrangement, that sense of loneliness, the intensity of samsara, grows with it and we find ourselves now in a context at least in the modern world where many people talk about uh, an epidemic of loneliness and from the perspective of these teachings in my experience it's an epidemic of separation 
it's an epidemic of that tendency to believe what we think more than what we feel and sense and know at a deeply embodied level. Yes. Yeah, so, and I think I've heard it described in some of the lectures I've heard uh, that it's like mistaking the menu for the meal. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And, you know, the menu, in this case, the menu is sometimes relatively reflective of what's actually going on in the kitchen and what's going to come onto your table, and sometimes very, very, very far removed. And um, when it's uh, far removed, that sense of loneliness is, uh, you know, that sense of separation and estrangement, estrangement is quite profound and uh, pervasive and deeply, deeply affecting. Right. Like when I think about the difference between a menu and a meal, I think, well, if I were to actually eat the menu, that would not be a very satisfying meal. No, no, it would not be a very satisfying meal. And, um, you know, if we're believing that the menus in the meal were, were not really, it's going to be difficult to recognize that sense of dissatisfaction in a conscious way. Because after all, here's the menu and it says uh, veggie burger. And uh, we're, I believe I'm eating a veggie burger. And that belief will um, mask our conscious awareness of that disconnection. And yet the body is going to be saying something about it. We're going to feel in a kind of deep and uh, subterranean way that something's off. And that's going to keep trying, continually be trying to push into our conscious awareness. But it will be there, you know, deep in our beings. You know, this wasn't nourishing. This wasn't what I need. This wasn't what I yearn for. Yes, and so you're bringing in the body here, and and I know that the body is a very central focus in your practice. Can you say more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, the body is um, the ground of all the work we do, and it needs to be said that um, when we're talking about the body, we're talking about the full, um, total expression of the body which means the body is this personal body, which we may, many of us identify with when we talk about um, the body. And then the body that holds our interpersonal relationships. So now we're getting to a slightly non-conventional understanding of the body. And then the body at its fullest extent um, is the whole cosmic order. And so what we're doing in this tradition with our, in our work with somatic meditation is seeking to come back into the body and in so doing so um, reclaim the fullness of our relationship with this personal body not what we think it is but what it actually is and the fullness of our relationships with the interpersonal others that we interact with and the fullness of our relationships with the cosmic order the sky and the earth and the clouds and the stars and that full embodiment is understood as um, you know, the complete realization of this human life. Yeah. So, so that sounds like an antidote to um, mistaking the menu for the meal. That that it sounds like what you're describing is the way that this lineage works with coming into a direct experience of the meal. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's a great way of putting it. You know, the lineage, these, these teachings, these practices are all about coming into a direct relationship with the fullness of the meal. Right. And there is a role. I mean, it is interesting. There is a role for the menu. So we're not throwing the menu out, but we're understanding that the menu is the menu and the meal is the meal because those thoughts, those ideas, those beliefs, they can be helpful. They can orient us in a certain way. But then we put down the menu and we actually check out what's on the table in front of us and what's on the plate in front of us and what's coming into our mouth and dissolving as we begin to digest. Mm -hmm. And why, I mean, in your, your lineage, why do you think there is such an epidemic of loneliness in the world these days? 
Well, I think um, maybe the first thing uh, that we could understand is, is loneliness or this estrangement that we're talking about, this experience of separation that I use the Buddhist term samsara to describe. Um, it, you know, it's not new. And, you know, this is what the Buddha was talking about, you know, 2,500 years ago. And chances are there was a, a growing suspicion of, of uh, this phenomenon in human life um, uh, creeping forward. And some would say since the beginning of, of agriculture, it's been something, the sense of separation and the sense of estrangement and the sense of loneliness has been um, creeping forward in our species. So it's not necessarily new. It seems like it, it's something that um, is fairly basic to a uh, sedentary, centralized, hierarchical kind of human way of organizing. But it does seem like it's been picking up um, in the modern world. And I think that there's a lot of things that you could point to. Um, the speed with which we live our lives, the um, relative lack of embodiment in our um, vocation, vocational lives. You know, in order to succeed in this world, it, it kind of tends to require a certain degree of disconnection from the body and emphasis on the head. Um, and then, you know, although we're gathering through this particular medium, I think the, the modern, very modern advent of, um, you know, the online world is um, also exacerbating that. You know, I don't believe that um, a computer or a email or a text or a Zoom call is necessarily disembodied. Um, for much of the year, I lead online programs in Dharma Ocean, and we do a lot of work at, in how to embody while we're working on the computer, how to embody while we're on a Zoom call, how to embody when we send an email. And it's really remarkable because I personally can actually feel my connection with the other person when I, go, when I do this work. But the honest truth is that's not the way most of us engage these technologies. These technologies are engaged in a, uh, to go back to some of the things I was saying earlier, in a very speedy and a very heady kind of way, which seems to be exacerbating the estrangement we've been talking about, the phenomenon of loneliness that's the focus of this whole gathering. Yes. So, so this is a spontaneous request that is just arising in this moment, which is, Neil, would you share with me and with our audience what, what you were just talking about? Like, let's say we're sitting down to the computer. How would you invite us to be embodied? Hmm. I mean, the simple way is um, just this very quick protocol that we could go through where we're at the computer, we're about to engage a Zoom recording, or we're about to send an email. And just before we do this, take a moment and feel the body. Just feel the body. And feel the presence of the earth underneath. And within this, just let the spine naturally lengthen slightly and the head naturally adjust from this lengthening. There'll be a lift at the back of the head, back of the skull, a lowering of the chin, opening of the back of the neck. The ears may come back towards the shoulder, shoulders. And just for a moment, be the body and be the posture. And if your mind's wandering around a lot, you can ground it a little bit by just focusing very lightly on a sense of a single stream of breath coming into the lower belly, kind of like you have a single nostril in your lower belly. And when we begin to engage this technology from this 
place. The speed has slowed down a little bit. The rampant conceptuality, the rampant thinking has dropped down. That energy has dropped down into the body a little bit. And there's a sense of the earth underneath. And it may be um, a little bit tentative at this point, but within this embodiment, there'll be a sense of a tentative sense of the other. It may be quite vague. It may be much more specific. And so within this embodiment and with this sense of other, however it might be, we type our email, we send our text, we watch the Zoom call. And whenever we lose this connection, which we will again and again and again, you just take a moment to come back. And it can be very quick. Body, earth spine, breath, and just be the body and come back. Thank you for that. And I noticed that I started this call with you in a very speedy place because I was multitasking right before we got on this call and now I'm in a very different space because yeah. of this. Yeah, it's, it, it, uh, it gives rise to a very different way of uh, engaging over these technologies. And, um, you know, from the point of view of these teachings and practices, our connection, you and I, in this instance, isn't really bound by time and space. If we drop deeply into the body, we can actually find that sense of connection with one another. Um, it's also true that our connection, you know, myself and yourself and whoever might be watching this is actually not bound by time and space. And so we can actually find one another within a deep experience of the body. And, you know, maybe by taking one minute at the beginning of a call or the beginning of a text, we don't uh, get, in quotes, all the way there. But we begin to bridge the gap that is giving rise to the loneliness so many of us feel just a little bit. And in my perspective, from my perspective, that's really the task, just a little bit. Come into the body just a little bit. Lessen the gap just a little bit. Feel the connection just a little bit. It's a pretty uh, enormous accomplishment from my view, in my view. Yes. And, and as you were talking, I, uh, I did imagine our listeners are, who are at this point in, a, in conventional per concepts of time, they are in the future. Yeah. But, but it's, it's interesting to conceive of them as here now. Yeah. yeah. It's very, very interesting. And, you know, it's there. It's there if we come into the body because that's what the body is, is if you want to use, you know, kind of somewhat dualistic language, you know, it's, it, the body is relationship. It holds the fullness of our relationship with everything. And that fullness, I mean, this is probably worth mentioning as well. That fullness is there all the time. It's not something we need to earn or develop. It's not that something that some of us have and others of us don't, you know, it's not the um, exclusive uh, 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 possession of Buddhists or meditators or Dharma ocean practitioners. It's there all the time. And all we need to do is understand that it's there all the time and have the tools, have the practices that let us uh, connect with that. And I guess be willing to put them into play. Be willing to take a minute, one minute before sending that text, one minute before watching that Zoom call, one minute before um, pressing play on the TED Talk on YouTube or whatever it might be. Mm. And yet, how much, how often do we just go on automatic pilot and, 
and not do that. Yeah. Well, this gets back to, you know, the samsaric roots of um, what we're talking about, loneliness. Um, and, you know, the, the belief systems that we develop and come to um, um, believe, that we develop and come to have a fierce loyalty to in that samsaric state of mind, that separated state of mind, are completely convincing. And, you know, I don't think there's probably any of us on this call um, who have um, not had the experience of had a belief, having a belief come up, I have to do this now, I don't have time, and being utterly mesmerized by it. Utterly mesmerized. Yes, yes. And I can speak experientially just right now to I think that the quality of my presence in this call really changed when we did that practice. Yeah. And I can't tell you how grateful I am that we did it. Yeah. Because I really had the experience before we did it of that I was a talking head, you know, and I was, you know, it just <laughs> And but something and you mentioned how the body tells you uh, things like your body tells you when you're uncomfortable. For example, I received some kind of message that says, said to me, ask Neil to do the embodiment protocol now, yeah. you know? And then there was this other voice that said, oh no, that wasn't part of our plan. We shouldn't, I can't ask him to do that. But then, <laughs> then the voice was very insistent, you know? So I listened to it and, you know. And, you know, that's a great example, I think, of the dynamic we're all facing in, with this work is, um, you know, that the two voices on the shoulder, right? The voice of the body that actually is the shoulder and the voice that's of the mind that's resting, of the plan, of the agenda that's resting on, floating just above the uh, opposite shoulder. and. Um, for whatever reason, and you know, I don't think we need to blame ourselves for this. It's not that we're bad people at all. It's just for whatever reason, um, we personally and culturally and globally perhaps have become habituated to listen to this voice. And the separation um, from that other voice, the voice that you actually trusted a few minutes ago and let us actually come into this experience in a different way, the separation from that is so painful. It's agonizing. It's, you know, not simply lonely, it's excruciating. And the opposite, the connection is so nourishing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, the there's, there's no comparison. I feel so much more nourished in this moment by this connection with you, by this imagining our whole audience, yeah, you know? Yeah, and uh, you know, that nourishment, it's like this taproot that exists for us all the time, but we just pretend there's no taproot because we don't have time, right? But as soon as we tap into the, that taproot, the, uh, the sense of nourishment, that's a beautiful word, the sense of nourishment is so profound. And, you know, maybe our loneliness won't um, disappear completely because, you know, there are probably other causes and conditions in the loneliness that many of us experience. However, um, it'll reduce a little bit and um, things will open up a little bit. And that voice that exists within all of us that has some very wise and directed um, sensings about how to resolve or address our own personal sense of loneliness now has an opportunity to come forth and guide us into the world in a new way. Yes, I, I do have the experience that that's an important part of working with loneliness is, is listening to not the, not the conventional voice of our conceptual mind, but the other one that brings us the unexpected uh, instructions um, or suggestions or requests 
you know, um, and that part of what we need to do is learn how to listen to it and then also learn how to do what it says. Yes. How, how to have that, the commitment or the devotion to, to act on, on it. Um, yeah. And I mean, those are great words, the commitment and devotion to act on it. And, you know, I mean, there's so many consequences. We've talked about a, a softening of the experience of loneliness. We've talked about nourishment. Um, the, the other thing is that as we begin to do this, this heady voice um, on the on one of our shoulders that we normally spend, you know, all our days dialoguing with and, and obeying, this heady voice begins to transform. It begins to settle down a little bit. It begins to actually touch the shoulder rather than float above the shoulder. It begins to get a little bit more embodied. And we begin to realize that, you know, sometimes, oftentimes, this heady voice actually has something for us. This heady voice is a kind of surface manifestation of something deep within us that we're estranged from, that we've forgotten, that we've dismissed or that we've disconnected from, that wants a little bit of this nourishing attention as well. So we begin to kind of bridge the gap between this and this and address loneliness on a different level. Hmm. As you were talking, I found myself longing for an example um, of when the heady voice has something or it's pointing us towards something that could be nourishing in deep, more deeply. Yeah. Does any example come to mind for you? Well, you know, I think a um, uh, uh, general example uh, might be, you know, if we have a voice that says, um, I'm no good and I need to work hard all the time and I need to be perfect and I can't slow down. Um, once we begin to slow down, once we begin to come into the body a little bit, once we begin to um, bridge that gap of separation and estrangement that we've been talking about, of loneliness that we've been talking about, and this has an opportunity to settle as well, we begin to maybe hear or feel or sense that that belief that I'm no good actually goes back decades. That belief that I'm no good is something that I learned very early on when I was maybe five years old and uh, being bullied in the playground at school. That belief that I'm no good is actually a little five-year-old individual or a three-year-old individual or a one-year-old individual who just needs a little bit of time and a little bit of connection and a little bit of attention to begin to unwind and soften and shift. And as that shift happens, much of the uh, surface manifestations of that belief begins to unwind. You know, I have to be busy all the time. I have to be perfect. I have to always do for others so that they love me. They don't necessarily go away, but they unwind a little bit. Just yeah. a little. Yes, and I, I, my sense is that what helps the unwinding is that you, the process you, in the process you described, there was some attention that was brought to the five-year-old, yeah. to the one who was bullied, um, that was nourishing for that five-year-old, and that that is part of what helps to transform the experience, the headiness that you were talking about. Like it's, yeah. it's almost like this reciprocal thing that happens. The headiness changes, but also the five-year-old changes. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's really um, one way we can understand meditation altogether is we're depend we're, developing our capacity to simply attend to our lives, not to do anything to our lives, not to fix our lives or to change our lives, but to attend to what's there. And part of the reason that five-year-old is manifesting in the world as that five-year-old is with this voice on our shoulder that's just driving us all the time is because that five-year-old has never simply been attended to as they are. Yeah. And as we, uh, we settle, as we allow that part of ourselves to settle, 
they're allowed to just be there, sad, angry, lost, rejected, lonely, whatever it might be. And, um, you know, that's transformative. We all know that. If ever, someone simply witnesses us, if someone, someone's willing to simply be with us as we are, we all know how transformative that is. And that is true for these parts of ourselves as well. Yes. And uh, so there's two things that you said um, that I don't want to lose track of. Um, but I'll, and I'll say the second one first, which is that it's, transformative to bring this quality of attention to um to ourselves and that oh what i wanted to say is that we have such an aversion to that mm -hmm. it's almost like we're afraid of what will happen if we bring the attention to the five-year-old like it might be too much or and then so then these habits of turning away kind of build up over years. Um, so there's, there's some, some work that has to be done to do this kind of tending that you're talking about. Um, it's not just like it happens like that. Like there's these layers that we yeah. work with, you know? Yeah, and I think I used the phrase developing capacity a few minutes ago, and that's what we're really talking about. We're developing our capacity to attend and you're drawing our attention now to that, that phrase, developing capacity. It's a slow, gradual path. You know, we sit down and we come into the body in the way we did a few minutes ago. We lessen that estrangement enough to notice that maybe we're a little bit tired today. And, you know, it's like, oh, why am I tired? This is terrible. I shouldn't be tired during an interview. We develop the capacity to actually stay present with that. And once we've developed that capacity, then something a little bit more, a little deeper comes up. Oh, I'm a little unsettled and a little uneasy and a little uh, um, uncertain right now. And we start thinking about it, which is what happens when we meditate. And we keep drawing the attention back into the body until we settle. We've strengthened our capacity to be with our experience. And then something even deeper comes up and then something even deeper, until eventually we are meeting these four, five, six-year-old parts of ourselves um, that have been screaming for attention for um, a very, very, very long time. Yes, and so you bring to mind my experience that actually gave birth to this project in the first place, which was of tending a two-year-old part of myself who had an experience of loneliness. Yeah. And the, the two things that I really want to name that really supported the developing capacity in me were one, um, what has been described in this lineage as Buddha nature, like me sort of hearing those teachings and being able to develop a basic trust in that, uh, in basic goodness, yeah. you know, and to know that that's kind of the foundation. And then that basic that became the source of my courage and strength to do yeah. the hard work of facing the two-year-old you yeah. know and so i just wonder if you could speak a little bit to what for our listeners i know it's a lot to ask but yeah. about what buddha nature is and how can how could they start to connect with that yeah Pema Chodron, um, who is a, uh, was also a student of Chögyam Trungpa um, and is a uh, very, very well-known and well-loved teacher in her own right, she often will say, we have everything we need. In fact, if you read her books or go to her talk, she often starts with that statement. We have everything we need in one way, shape, or form. That's how she um, kicks things off, so to speak. And what she's pointing to is what you're speaking to, Buddha nature, you know, um, basic goodness, is that at our uh, true foundation, we are uh, clear. We can know situations for what they are. We are sensitive. We can feel what is inherent 
what is given in any experience and we are responsive we have the capacity to respond to uh, each and every situation and responding of course sometimes includes not doing anything overt just holding attending witnessing being present with but you know we, these uh qualities are inherent in who we are as human beings and you know the path of meditation we talked about developing our capacity to be with our experience as we develop that capacity and as we are with that experience we come into ever closer relationship with that Buddha nature, with that basic goodness. And it begins to percolate more overtly, more consciously through our life. And it becomes accessible. We hear the voices. We know, we follow the inklings. We see the situation utterly for what it is. You know, this is nothing um, extraordinary. It's actually something completely ordinary coming through, which is our basic nature. And um, that's the path of meditation, is developing a deeper relationship with that. Yes, and then, of course, it becomes fuel. It becomes nourishment. The more yeah. we develop our relationship with that, it nourishes the deeper and deeper layers of the, um, what we're cultivating our capacity to uh, be in relationship with. Yeah. You know? Very so, much so. Yeah, so it's like tapping into a fuel, a source of fuel. I know that that sounds kind of mundane, and but it it feels that way to me. No, know? and I think I think the mundane um, articulations of these teachings are really helpful for us. It helps us kind of really understand. Okay, that's what's being pointed to here. Yeah. And so many people, I, I feel like the experience of loneliness has to do with an estrangement from that Buddha nature. Yes. Yes. I mean, because the body, that's what the body, that's what um, our relationships, that's what the cosmos is, are, is Buddha nature. And so when we're separated, that's what we're separating from. Mm. When we're estranged, that was, that's what we're estranged from, our own basic nature, which is why it's so painful. However it might manifest, whether you call it uh, suffering, using Buddhist language, or whether you call it loneliness, which is the language we're using here it's uh so painful to be separated from our own basis yes in fact that beautiful word basis the image that arose as you were speaking is of a plant being pulled up by its roots yeah. and and that that like if you really i mean i'm a visual imaginal person so i I could immediately experience excruciating pain for the plant when I imagined that. And so that's, that's what you're talking about is when we're cut off from our Buddha nature, that is how, how painful it is. Yeah. And you know, we've all experienced this many, many, many times. A lot of times people will come and take part in a meditation program. And I'm sure this applies to any other sort of personal growth or spiritual um, development program. And, uh, you know, then we go home and we feel so wretched very quickly. And we think, oh, it's because there's something wrong with home. Well, there's nothing wrong with home. It's that we've separated and we're misappropriating. You know, people will leave a retreat and a few days later, I'll get an email saying, oh, it's just not the same. I feel so lonely now. I feel so disconnected. My home life just doesn't, isn't it. And it's like, well, no, it's not the home life. It's the act of disconnection. And if we would come back in, we'd find that nourishment and connection in our dirty dishes and in our grocery lists and, um, you know, in the errands we need to do before birthday times or holiday season or whatever it might be. Hmm. So that seems like a beautiful place for us to bring our discussion to a close the dirty dishes and the to-do <laughs> list and the opportunity to really come home to our present moment embodied a connection to the earth and to our bodies and to our life as it is is in is available all the time all the time all the time yeah. and i think one of our challenges in this modern world is to actually practice that, put that into practice so that we are doing it all the time. As we're 
in the bank lineup and as we're about to enter a meeting at work and uh, as we're sitting down with our friends and families for dinner to remember that and come back and just for a moment just a little come back to that connection come home yes yes and that is i i've often told people or you know clients or students that meditation is the practice of coming back again and again and again and that there's a reason why they call it practice <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is a good reason why they call it practice yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes so just um before we end, is there anything you'd like to let our, our listeners know about how they might um, find out more about your work or connect with you? Hmm. Um, I think the best way is through my website, which is neilmckinley.com. And I'm, uh, uh, as Laura well pronounced it at the beginning, I'm an L-A-Y McKinley, not an L-E-Y. So neilmckinley.com, it'll give you a sense of uh, the work that I do and the offerings that are coming up. It'll also link you into um, the Greater Dharma Ocean website, which is the community that I work with. And uh, you'll see what kind of resources are, and opportunities are um, available there. And, um, you know happy exploring and um, take the time, all of us, just take the time. It doesn't take much. Just take the time to reconnect and, uh, you know, wish all of us the best of luck in this regard. Thank you, Neil. Much gratitude and appreciation to you for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. It's been a pleasure.